Welcome back to For All Kerbal Kind. Last episode, both space programs saw a satellite put in orbit. Beardy beat me by 45 days, as we can see here. But both of us are still just capable of barely putting anything into orbit. This episode, I'm hoping to look at maybe putting things in orbit that can stay there for much longer than two and a half hours. Uh, but definitely fulfilling some contracts that push satellites just a little bit further. Here we see Sputnik in orbit and the Kedstone in orbit. Looks like I got up to 2,000 kilometers and he only got to half a thousand kilometers. So, I mean, my satellite's higher. But yeah, <laughs> he beat me by 45 days. So what we have is almost 300k funds and I need to decide where that needs to go because we need to speed up our program a lot uh, but we do need to save some money for some things there's a lot of decision making to do but i think what i'm going to do is spend all of it on kct points to make research and vehicle building faster however first i'm going to get the next few rockets situated before i dump any points in so i can sort of balance things between r d and the vab so let's get to some rocket building well the first thing we have on our list to build isn't exactly a rocket no this is our x plane the kel x2 long boy is being refit after the events of last episode we need to make this thing capable of high altitude flight we need this thing to be safer than ever before capable of landing on actual landing gear uh, but the first thing we are getting situated here is the RCS ports. We are going to be using those to control that in the upper atmosphere where our control surfaces are practically useless. And we've also swept the wings a bit to add a, a little bit less drag. Uh, I think it'll help with lift and less drag and supersonic flights. I'm, I'm not really an expert on aerodynamics, but it, it, if it has a swept wing, it looks like it goes faster. So it obviously must go faster, right? That's my mindset. Uh, anyways, we're uh, covering the top of these uh, landing gear with black paint just so that they don't stick out white on the top there. I didn't really like how that looked. It's the same draught tanks, except yeah, we have three landing gear now, so we'll be able to land pretty much however we want. And I also changed the way the tail looks a bit. I messed around a little bit with having a bottom side tail fin for yaw as well, but the instability was just absolutely insane. So I ended up deleting that, but we did put our elevators, our tail wings in that regard, swept and on the bottom of the aircraft instead of connected to the tail wing so it's a bit interesting i think we have a little bit more pitch control when we have to pitch up a lot versus when it's on the tail wing it's sort of blocked by the main wings in the airflow so i think we will increase stability with this quite a lot so we got swept wings landing gear we're adjusting our ejection system here and also we are going to slap a small wheel onto the butt of this aircraft just so that we don't strike the bottom and blow up the whole darn thing Next up, we have our Kedstone 1 rocket, which we are simply adding integral tanks instead of separate structure. Because last episode, we did have integral tanks unlocked, but we didn't have enough time to actually apply it to our missile here. So this increases our efficiency by decreasing mass. And I think it also increases utilization as well. Basically, it's just a good idea to get out of the way. As for our Ketstone 2 missile, we are simply decreasing the amount of helium on board, as well as getting a new science experiment on board for the science gains. In Wallops, we have another sounding rocket I'd like to build. We are upgrading our KBRM-1 to the KBRM-2, this time no longer carrying any payload for the US Air Force, because as we know from last episode, as soon as you complete the first satellite, all sounding rocket contracts just disappear. So this is now on a science collection mission, and it's not gonna be able to do a whole lot, but I intend on basically flying this through the upper atmosphere, collecting a tiny little bit of science every time it launches, and this just going on in the background 
as our complex in Brownsville, Texas builds bigger and bigger rockets like satellites. And eventually I would like Wallops to also launch the Scout launch vehicle. However, we don't quite have the technology for it yet. So it's pretty much just in the background, buying time and getting a very, very small trickle of science as it does so. But that's gonna wrap up the builds for the intro here. So we can go ahead and spend all of our money and stuff now. All right, with those under construction, it looks like our space center is hovering in the air. That's always nice. But anyways, we're gonna move ahead to spending all of our money, basically. First thing we're gonna do is accept this contract because we are in fact able to do that. That's what Ketstone One is going to do. 292K funds now. So let's go into our upgrade points. Let's see, where exactly, <laughs> where are we? We appear to have moved to an island somewhere in the middle of the ocean? That's kind of interesting. So let's put all of the money we possibly can into upgrade points. The wallop site here with our sounding rockets are getting one single point. Now let's move on over to Brownsville where we are going to put everything else. All right, heading into research and development, I think this node here, 1956 to 57 orbital rocketry, is what we are going to start with. April 25th, 1955. Late in the day, a final refitted Kedstone 1 is rolled out and readied for launch. Its payload, a small monkey aboard a capsule specially designed to keep them safe during the intense flight, intends to be lifted further and faster than ever before. All systems are go as the clock counts down to liftoff. systems are nominal throughout liftoff and the capsule is jettisoned from the Kedstone missile, left on its trajectory above and into the Gulf of Mexico. This late in the day, it is actually easier for the US Navy and Air Force to acquire visual contact of the small capsule, and recovering the happy-to-be-home space explorer within is made swiftly. The mission is a resounding success. Okay, the morning after a successful launch in the mission control, we have one more advanced biological suborbital experiment contract, this time to do the exact same thing, except reach a speed greater than 4,000 meters per second orbital speed. Unfortunately, this is too fast of a speed for the capsule to re-enter without burning up on re-entry. So we're gonna have to do something to slow down before we re-enter, but this is entirely possible. So we're going to accept this contract, boost our funds up, and we're gonna decide what we wanna do with the funds later. Uh, for right now, we're gonna hop into the vehicle assembly building and set up this mission, which is gonna be a combination of the Kedstone 1 and Kedstone 2. We're gonna merge those together and get a capsule that can reach 4,000 meters per second and then slow down a little bit before re-entry. I'm going to go ahead and drop one point into the VAB. May 13th, 1955. A brand new aircraft, the Kel X-3, has arrived in Brownsville, Texas. It is capable of high altitude flight, something the Soviet Union has become well known for, according to certain covert informants. Eileen Kerman, a now-decorated pilot for the Foundation, has played a major role in establishing the flight plan for today's mission. Eileen is set out to match the highest altitude record set by Soviet air launch test pilots to date, but she aims to do this, taking off from a runway on the ground.
drop tanks are jettisoned shortly after one minute taking off into the gulf. Eileen keeps the aircraft in a shallow climb before leveling out just above 10 kilometers altitude, gaining speed for the most daring maneuver ever attempted by Foundation pilots. Reaching 550 meters per second, Eileen pulls close to 8 Gs as she transfers her horizontal speed into a vertical climb. The powerful engines behind her continue to propel the aircraft upwards as the atmosphere quickly bleeds away, leaving all control to reaction control thrusters utilizing highly pressurized HTP. Eileen brings the aircraft to an altitude of 76 kilometers, just over the surface ceiling of the aircraft's breathing system. But Eileen is breathless for a different reason. This is the closest to space Kerbalkind has ever seen. So close one could just reach up and be there. And yet all too soon, the aircraft reaches apogee and begins to fall back into the atmosphere again. But just for a moment, the final frontier was within reach. Eileen's aircraft nosedives at breakneck speeds straight down into the atmosphere. She must wait until reaching the lower atmosphere before pulling out of the dive. Until then, the X-3 is a missile headed straight down to the surface, certain death. Even arriving below 30 kilometers, if she is to pull too hard on the stick, the aircraft might just disintegrate around her. With a mere few hundred meters to spare, she pulls out of the dive. Flight control erupts into a roar of celebration, and Eileen performs a barrel roll just to solidify the mission. Flight isn't over until wheels touch the tarmac, however. Eileen reports she's approaching stall speed as she makes the shallow turn towards runway 27. Just narrowly missing the ground with the tail of the aircraft, she successfully touches down with no further issue, and a big sigh of relief. This mission has single-handedly brought the Foundation back into the light amidst the Red Scare, and just for a moment, morale and optimism are once again as high as the sky. Oh boy, that got us a lot more money than I thought it would. We hit a lot of altitude records. I think each one incrementally gives us funds, 50 kilometers, 60 kilometers, 70 kilometers. And well, of course we did that as well as completing our contract of only reaching 50 kilometers. So that's always nice. And the mission controls, it looks like we have four X-Plane contracts to choose from. These X-Planes high contracts are the most profitable, and it looks like I'll be able to complete a few more of these. This one is only 70 kilometers, so it looks like Peter gets to fly the exact same mission, or I might try air launching it. Although, to be honest, it is more fun taking off and then landing, to be honest. So we're gonna grab the X-Planes high difficult because 20k advancements funds, that's a free KCT point, and then another one for completing it. So let's accept that and then figure out what we're gonna do with all our money. For now, we're going to be putting it all into KCT points again. It's now just deciding, well, where that's going to go. So I think we're gonna put two into the VAB and then three into R&D. May 22nd, 1955. Just over a week after Eileen's brave mission, Peter is determined to pull off the exact same stunt. kilometers above the edge of the stratosphere as Peter takes in the view of stars directly in front of him.
all too soon, the eye of the storm has passed and the thrill ride continues once again. Peter struggles with the reaction control thrusters, reporting an unplanned but controllable spin on the way down. Luckily, he is able to pull out of the dive with ease and glides his way back to the KSC. Touching down successfully, both remaining pilots have now flown as close to the edge of space as possible, and are eager to grab a beer and discuss what the future of space travel might be like. That flight was exhilarating as always back into the mission control. Um, I'm deciding to finish off the fourth of four experimental rocket plane contracts because these X-Plane High contracts, first of all, the X-Plane High difficult, we can't reach 90 kilometers yet without, well, making the pilot suffocate. This one we are capable of completing, but if we look at the current reward percentage, it is at zero. So there's absolutely no point in doing this yet until we can actually profit off of it. Explain Supersonic is about 3,000 funds more profitable. However, I didn't want to finish this one off because it was the last one. So we're going to accept that. And then we have 63k funds. That is looking like two upgrade points to me. And we are going to split them up. We're going to put one in the R&D and one in the vehicle assembly building. June 9th, 1955. The X-3 experimental aircraft is ready for flight once again. Eileen straps herself in and readies herself for a routine testing of various systems in flight. Dropping from a carrier 9,000 meters up at 175 meters per second, only half of the engine chambers initially fire. This becomes evident to the pilot immediately, and the problem is remedied. The X-3 starts its shallow climb to reach an intended 28 kilometers altitude. Nearing the targeted altitude for tests, all internal systems suddenly shut down, save for the engines, which continue to thrust the aircraft higher. The pilot struggles to reset flight systems as ground control scrambles to find the cause for the problem. Luckily, Eileen is able to reset flight systems and regain control of the aircraft before any further problems occur. Eileen is instructed to glide the aircraft back to the KSC for analysis immediately, which she intends to do. Approaching runway 09er, Eileen reports speed is excessive and that she is about to do something unorthodox to bleed speed. Ground Control nervously watches the X-3 perform a barrel roll before disappearing from view, diving beneath the runway from their perspective. later, an explosion erupts into view. Luckily, the ejection system performs its necessary function to save Eileen from the wreckage. Fire crews and paramedics rush down to the runway towards Eileen, who slowly emerges from the bent-up cockpit, her thumb high in the air indicating high spirits despite the mess of a flight today. July 9th, 1955. Wallops resumes flight tests into and above the upper atmosphere with sounding missiles, this time with a brand new entry, the KBRM-2. Aiming to study scientific equipment in environments such as the vacuum of space, 12 seconds after liftoff, the Air B engine experiences a transient shutdown, and the missile reaches an altitude of just below only 14 kilometers, failing its mission. July 23rd, 1955. Early morning, a second Kedstone II is fueled and ready for launch. Its mission today is to place the Foundation's second satellite into orbit of the Earth, the Explorer II. Rather than a mere stunt brought on by political pressure of the Red Scare, this time scientific equipment has been installed. The small space probe will conduct ion mass spectrometry and measure radiation effects during its very brief two-hour period of operation.
minutes into the mission, the Ketstone 2's main engine prematurely shuts down, leaving the satellite 10 kilometers shy of its intended altitude for orbital insertion. It is quickly decided to fire the first of three Sargent stages early to increase this altitude and fill the gap. The remaining two booster stages would then wait until Apogee to propel Explorer 2 into orbit of the Earth. Six minutes and 38 seconds later after liftoff, Explorer 2 is successfully in orbit. The science instruments on board continue to run for just over two hours, transmitting its findings back to the team in Brownsville, Texas all the while. Mass spectrometry proves quite a successful endeavor, while radiation measurements fail to operate. Had the satellite been placed in an orbit just twice as high, perhaps there would have been more to discover. This mission resulted in a partial failure. We weren't able to reach the correct orbit for the contract because of that failure. So we are going to rebuild Kedstone 2 with Explorer 3. Uh, and partway through construction, we're gonna unlock early avionics and probes, which is hopefully gonna get us a slightly lighter, slightly longer lasting satellite. We were able to conduct one science experiment on board, which got us eight science, so let's go ahead and spend that eight science. We have 21 up top. Let's see what we want to get. I think our best bet right now is to go with primitive solar panels, because we have a solar contract, and these might help keep our satellites alive a little bit longer, which in turn will get us more science. All right, early avionics costs 4,000, so we're going to purchase that. We're down to 13k down here. Our build time went up to 65 days, but I believe that is because, yeah, this is technically no longer tooled. Uh, but you'll see our Delta V went up to like 10,325. That is actually really, really cool. So let's go down here and check this avionics. This is going to be 8,000 to purchase the early avionics type for near Earth. I'm going to hold off on doing this because of how little funds we actually have. Uh, now for tooling this avionics, just to speed up our build time by like a week or so, I think. Let's see, where is it? Yeah, only 127 funds. Yeah, so hardly anything to boost for 10 days there with that tooling. With the extra Delta V margin, I'm wondering if it's possible we could add on some new science experiments as well. So Explorer 3 will have the radiation detector and hopefully get to a higher orbit to actually make use of it, and also have an early TV camera as well. October 23rd, Explorer 3 eagerly awaits its mission atop a third Kedstone 2 missile. seconds into the flight, the Ketstone's main engine experiences thrust loss. This dramatically increases the duration of time required to burn through the entirety of its propellant, and with that increases the chance of an engine failure due to overburn, something studied with KBRM-1 launches the year before. Luckily, the engine does not fail despite this, and Explorer 3 is on its way to orbital insertion. During the final boost into low Earth orbit, the satellite was pointed ever so slightly too far above the horizon, accidentally lowering its final perigee a mere 7 kilometers below its intended orbit. Despite barely missing orbital parameters, due to recent upgrades in hardware, the satellite is able to stay alive for much longer, estimated to last anywhere from 1 to 4 days compared to just a few hours in previous launches. Explorer 3 continuously transmit data collected from a radiation detector. The data, once processed by ground teams, proves the existence of a Van Allen belt surrounding the Earth, a zone of energetic charged particles, most of which originate from solar wind captured by and held around Earth by its magnetic field. 
the Foundation, fascinated by this discovery, aims to launch a similar mission in three months' time. Explorer 3's batteries have just died, and the satellite lasted an unexpected five days. Well, four days, 23 hours, 41 minutes. It's pretty much five days. And I believe it collected about eight science for us so far, mostly from the visible imaging experiment, because the radiation experiment is something that lasts 90 some days. So we're gonna be launching some more satellites with that experiment on board in order to collect all the science from it, and in order to complete this science experiment from it, which we were so close! Seven kilometers higher on the perigee and we would have had it. So what I'm gonna do with Explorer 4 is aim for a bit of a higher initial apogee so that there's a little bit of a threshold just in case I point the nose too high again and mess with our perigee with the orbit. A little bit of a buffer should help us complete this contract finally. We're also unlocking a pretty major science node, which I know the Soviets have had all year. 56 to 57 orbital rocketry. This has a lot of engines for us, which means more capable rockets, satellites that can go higher, and a lot of fun. Unfortunately, I won't be able to utilize any of this until Explorer 4 completes its mission successfully, due to the fact that I only have 7,000 funds to my name right now. But we do have an X3 flight coming up next, which will hopefully get us just a little bit more money while we wait for Explorer 4 to arrive. November 1st, 1955. The Soviet Union launches their second satellite successfully into orbit of the Earth, Sputnik 3. All that is known of the craft to the Foundation is that undecipherable transmissions intercepted from it last for quite a long time, far outlasting the Explorer satellites to date. It is theorized Soviet solar panel technology is progressing rapidly, while the United States is still several months away from utilizing the same form of electricity production with their own satellites. November 19th, 1955. The launch facility in Wallops, Virginia readies themselves to fire another KBRM-2 missile into the upper atmosphere and beyond. Compared to science gained from satellites in orbit of the Earth, science gained would be comparably small. But in the race to space, every little bit counts. With four seconds of fuel remaining, the Air B engine shuts down. However, this does not deter its mission of researching the upper atmosphere in any regard. The instruments on board transmit small amounts of data before crashing into the Atlantic Ocean. We have 5,303 funds remaining at the current point in time, but luckily an X3 is ready for flight, and we can complete a 75 kilometer altitude contract no problem. At loading the edited craft file, it looks like all of the solid boosters decided to fire upon loading the vessel. And for the interest of safety, I'm gonna go ahead and recover this vessel and replace all of the solids for our ejection system so that we actually have an operational ejection system for the flight. So this might take another week or two, but that's all right. December 10th, 1955. It's now Peter's turn in a newly built X-3 aircraft. Five days prior, Peter had attempted today's flight, but ejection boosters fired shortly after being rolled out to the runway. The problem now resolved, Peter aims to complete the same mission he and Eileen flew earlier in the year once again reaching 75 kilometers altitude and nose diving back to glide to a landing. Reaching an altitude of 76 kilometers, Peter slowly spins the aircraft, 
allotting himself an unprecedented 360-degree view of the horizon from the edge of space. The X-3 handles perfectly as Peter corrects the spin to fall back into a denser atmospheric pressure. down at runway 27, the mission is a complete success. Okay, we'll be able to refit the X-3, put some fuel tanks on, and then air launch it to complete this X-plane supersonic flight, just holding above 500 meters per second at about 13 to 14 kilometers. Yeah, that should be absolutely no problem. Foundation has seen quite a successful year, launching three satellites into orbit of the Earth, despite the superior capabilities of Soviet counterparts, fills crew and faculty with high spirits during the holidays. Now, if only they could secure government funding from their Explorer satellites somehow, another successful launch might just about do it. January 2nd, 1956. Eileen is given the task to once again test X-3 systems during high-speed flight. This time, she is instructed not to perform any unplanned maneuvers. Released from the carrier aircraft, Eileen immediately and accidentally jettisons the drop tanks instead of lighting the engines. The XLR-11s are lit shortly afterwards, and Eileen proceeds with her mission as if nothing had occurred. Despite the loss of fuel from the start, the X-3 was able to maintain 14 kilometers altitude at 600 meters per second for three minutes. Eileen glides back around to runway 09-er and lands the aircraft with no further issues reported. Mission successful. January 19th, 1956. Explorer 4 is readied atop a Kedstone 2 missile. The previous satellite launched proved the existence of a Van Allen belt. This mission aims to conduct further radiation measurement studies of it. Liftoff is successful, and the Foundation's fourth satellite is on its way. Reaching a successful initial apogee of 275 kilometers, the booster stages are jettisoned and maneuvered to the desired orientation for orbital insertion. Three boosts occur in rapid succession, and Explorer 4 has been successfully placed into orbit of the Earth. With an apogee of over 10,000 kilometers, the satellite is able to measure radiation at a much wider range of altitudes. Furthermore, the accomplishments of the Explorer satellites have finally, and quite literally, paid off, as a contract is completed and funds have poured into the Space Center once again. The usefulness of Kedstone 2 missiles has proven invaluable to the interest of space exploration thus far, but the age of larger rockets is quickly approaching. With Explorer 4 in orbit, we finally got paid for that contract. I was just barely missing the past two launches, so we have a lot of money right now. And we're gonna take a look at Mission Control here to see the contracts we now have unlocked. This is the only one we have selected and active, the one of three, and we're gonna be doing this shortly. I was pushing back this launch to make sure I got the satellites in as quickly as possible. Uh, but for the contracts we have available to us, these were still here. A solar-powered satellite, which will have solar panels in about 80 days currently. A polar orbit satellite, which would be great for scientific satellites, since the polar biome ends up outputting a little bit more science than the others. And down here, 
we have our very first lunar contracts. These give us quite a lot of money, and specifically the advance of these I'm very excited about. Now, in order to really complete lunar contracts, we might be able to do it without maneuver nodes if we know how to time things correctly. However, I'm not the most accurate when it comes to doing things like that. So in order to unlock maneuver nodes, see if I can actually find it with the right click in this sort of buggy. Uh, there we go. So in order to upgrade maneuver nodes, it's going to cost 200k funds here uh, to upgrade to mission control. It'll give us more active contracts, which means more advanced money, as well as fulfilling one of the requirements. And the other requirement is the tracking station at 50k funds. So that would be 250k funds gone right away. However, with accepting new contracts we have would basically cover the entire cost of that. It's just a matter of do I think we'll be able to launch things successfully at the moon within three years? And I'm inclined to say yes. Now, taking a look at science here to back that up, I think we might be able to bootleg something that works without these nodes, but these nodes will make it a lot easier. And those would be Lunar Rage Communications, so we can have control and transmit science back all the way out to the moon. Basic avionics and probes will make probes lighter and use less power usage, but more importantly, it finally unlocks deep space avionics, which is avionics that can be shut down, that can go back and forth between controlling the spacecraft and a sort of sleep mode to save on power. However, these are quite heavy, I do believe, compared to the others. The other things that might help us out in this endeavor are the next engine nodes, which give us some much needed upgrades in order to lift heavier things into orbit as well as some new rockets two nodes down. Another thing to consider is building the 150 ton launch pad, which costs 150k funds. However, this I think can wait just a little bit. So what I've finally decided is we are adding more capable satellites and slightly larger rockets to our science initiative, as well as the tiniest of lunar probes, at least conceptually. So we are going to go ahead and upgrade mission control. That's a lot of our funds gone. We're going to go ahead and upgrade the tracking station. Well, it's going to have to wait for lunar range communications. So that gives me a really good idea of what tech node to decide on researching next. There we go. And then lastly, we are going back into the mission control building. After a lot of thought, I've decided to accept the smallest of the three advances with lunar flyby just to play it safe and to make sure I don't put us in a situation where we're forced to do things that compromise other missions. And we're going to accept the first polar orbit satellite because I'm going to attempt this with Explorer 5. Back up to 400k funds, we now have some rockets to build. Here we have the what will be Explorer 5 satellite, which is going to launch into a polar orbit around the Earth, which goes over the South and North Poles. What I ended up doing was swapping out the procedural avionics for our newly unlocked 20 inch x-ray detector, which is something that will last 10 days in orbit completing science experiments as opposed to 5 days with the previous Explorer satellites. Of course I added shininess cause you know that means it'll work better right? And we're doing another science experiment other than early TV camera and radiation detector. We also have applied a micrometeorite detector, so we will be detecting, well, micrometeorites bouncing off of the vessel if any are there. It's a 91 day duration science experiment just like the radiation detector, so we'll only be able to really complete about a ninth of that contract, but every little bit counts. And this will buy us time waiting for another rocket to build, which I'm going to be building next. This is also using the upgraded version of the, a, of the a series engine, the A7. And we also have tooled this avionics are now using the lighter version. I have just very smartly realized we have solar panels. I honestly did not realize this. Okay, so solar panels added 10 days to the build time. However, that is perfectly fine considering it's gonna complete the science experiments to their entirety so long as this makes it to orbit. Uh, we're still doing a polar launch, 
we've saved the craft file and now let's save the edits and now we can go to making the new vessel all right so this new probe is being vaguely inspired by the pioneer probes however it is going to be called pathfinder this is something that someone in the comment section uh, suggested for our first satellites which i ended up going with explorer but their name and their uh description of why they suggested this name was just too good not to use uh, more than just an explorer pathfinder lights the way for all future vessels and considering i'm going to be trying to launch this at least towards the moon it just fit way too well and with our solar panels on board i'm so glad that i realized we actually had those unlocked for a while uh, that makes this mission entirely possible. I thought we had to wait for the next node, the next solar panel node to come out, but well, we have solar panels and we are absolutely going to use them. For the probe, it's going to have a solid booster, and this solid booster was uh, the real life Vanguard upper stage which would put things into orbit of the earth however we are putting that entire stage into orbit of the earth and that will be the stage that will launch us towards the moon you need about 3100 3200 give or take meters per second of delta v to get from low earth orbit to the moon and that's exactly what it ended up having and i was quite happy with that our pretty much goal for Pathfinder would be to get close enough to the moon to at least get to its sphere of influence just to transmit a little more science back and also to show the Soviets we definitely mean business in this space race you've been first in everything up until now but we are going to try to push ahead here and we're actually going to be attempting this before any attempt on the soviets part if i'm not mistaken so even if it fails it's definitely going to well <laughs> mean business for them now the rocket itself is vaguely based off of the thor rocket the first stage here is the first variant of the LR-79 engine, which in real life was the R&D versions of Thor missiles. Basically, it is not the most efficient, and it is very likely to fail. It's got a 20% failure rate-ish, and I think with extra pre-flight, we brought that down to about 15% or 17%. And I think the same goes for the upper stage, the second stage, which will put our probe into orbit of the Earth. Uh, the AJ-10 early, and that is basically the Vanguard upper stage. In fact, the solid booster is also from Vanguard. They're both from Vanguard. So we have a Thor Guard uh, as opposed to a Thor Able. However, it is simply called the Pathfinder missile for all intents and purposes. When we have the next engine node unlocked, we will have the technology for the Thor Able, uh, except for the solid booster on the top. That's going to be a few nodes away, I do believe. The tanks on the side of the upper stage here are actually holding HTP for the RCS thrusters, which those thrusters move around a bit. I have spent like four or five different times throughout 1956 going back and giving this craft some small edits every now and then so it's a little bit difficult to try to keep track of everything that has gone on with the edits like things have changed what you see here there's there's some slight differences um basically yeah those rcs ports will go down i think we'll add another one as well and we've also thrown some flags onto this craft now the last little bit of edit we are going to give the pathfinder probe and i think this was later on in the year that we're doing this footage on screen is adding rcs ports to the probe itself now we are able to use these for final velocity adjustment due to the fact that when we have no avionics control we still have fore and aft control and considering it's a solid booster and we don't need to change our attitude to go fore or aft these are going to be what ensures we can at least try to get close to the moon so the booster will take us most of the way there and our rcs ports will finish the job all right so purchasing all of our funds here we're gonna have a total of nine i'm gonna put see do, do, do we're at 34 in the vab not including the i think two points in wallops now and then 49 in research 
February 18, 1956. Intelligence and tracking systems indicate the successful launch and insertion of a satellite into a polar orbit of the Earth by the USSR. Meanwhile, plans for attempting the same feat are well underway in the United States, once again slow to the draw. March 16, 1956. A Ketstone 2B missile is rolled out onto the launch pad. A brave space explorer in the form of another small monkey is carefully boarded into the specially fit capsule system, keeping them alive and relatively comfortable for the duration of the coming flight. This time around, the intention is to up the ante, reaching velocities higher than 4 kilometers per second on a suborbital flight, which would transport the small critter across the gulf to the coast of Florida, where Navy recovery vessels await. Successful liftoff and the capsule is away. All systems report nominal behavior for the duration of four and a half minutes, at which time retro thrusters fire to slow the craft for re-entry. The intense heat such a trajectory would have provided in a purely ballistic re-entry is proven to melt materials used on the vessel. A new type of heat-resistant surface will be required to advance flights like these as far as orbit of the Earth, and much further beyond. As for now, our little critter has a safe flight and drifts slowly down to the Gulf of Mexico via parachute. With that successful mission, what's next is to accept the first solar-powered satellite contract, as our next satellite will have solar panels on it. Let's do three. Three points into our VAB. April 14th, 1956. Wallops, Virginia performs another successful KBRM-2 test flight probing the upper atmosphere. Despite an initial aerodynamic occurrence causing the missile to climb higher than intended, a small amount of data from the upper atmosphere was still collected. June 10th, 1956. Explorer 5 is readied atop a new Kedstone missile, intent on reaching a polar orbit to study any differences in radiation measurements high above the North and South Pole. The new satellite features more robust internal clockwork, as well as external solar panels to keep the batteries alive for an undetermined period of time, though it is assumed several months of active data collection and transmission at the very least. A highly reflective surface encapsulates the small satellite in hopes of acquiring visual contact from the ground due to the sun's reflection. Onboard sensors are designed to detect strikes from micrometeorites on its surface as well. 
For the next week or so, people of the United States find themselves looking up in an attempt to catch a glimpse of sunlight gleaming from the satellite passing overhead. An artificial shooting star, if it were. One with no intent of falling down to the surface. Successfully completing first solar and first polar contracts netted us with a lot of money and also access to a whole plethora of satellite contracts. Looks like five of them, and I'm not sure what one I want to go with quite yet. But before we accept anything, the first thing we need to do, we need to upgrade the tracking station. Honestly, the new rocket we built for the Pathfinder probe is capable of doing communications, atmospheric analysis, sun synchronous, navigational satellites. Like, it's going to be able to do a bunch of satellites in Earth orbit. I don't know if it's going to be capable of geostationary quite yet, but it's possible that we could build a probe small enough to actually do this. So we can probably fulfill all of these contracts with that rocket. It'll get better as time goes on. Uh, as well as these lunar contracts, the first ones as well. So I'm really confident we're able to do this. And in about 75 days, we'll have a max of seven contracts. So we'll be able to do a bunch of them, possibly a few at once. Uh, it's really looking exciting for that. But one of the contracts we have to accept right now is X-Planes Supersonic. So with our 16 science, I'm going to go ahead and select the 1958 orbital rocketry node. We get an upgrade to our AJ-10 and an upgrade to our LR-79, which is used on the new rocket. And that'll make getting things into orbit even easier. We'll be able to put a little bit heavier payloads and that will be absolutely fantastic as we move ahead. Peter gets another X-3 flight under his belt today, looking to perform routine high-speed testing in the aircraft. Touching down on the final stretch of the runway, the mission comes to a close. Success. Another X-3 flight under our belt. We're going to go ahead and grab four KCT points. We're putting two in the VAB and two in R&D. Tracking station just got upgraded. Now we're warping ahead one more day where mission control will be upgraded from level one to level two. And at that point, we have patched conics, we have flight planning, we have maneuver nodes. There we go. And we also have max active contracts of seven. It's possible we could do a sun synchronous orbit with 100 units of NAVSAT payload, as well as a temperature scan and a barometer scan. I wonder if it will let me select all of these at once. I think it will. And if I do that, we'll be able to knock all three of these out of the way. Also, accept the Lunar Impactor contract as well. Because if we get a Lunar Impactor, it also meets the requirements for Lunar Flyby because, you know, you have to go within 5,000 kilometers in order to, well, impact the moon after all. September 16th, 1956. Nerves at the KSC in Brownsville, Texas have reached an all-time high as the Pathfinder 1 has completed all status checks. Its mission today will be, for the first time, to explore Earth's closest neighbor and only natural satellite, the Moon. If all goes well, the Pathfinder probe will be set on an impact trajectory, and on the several day journey to get there, continuously transmit data from onboard instruments about the effects of radiation, temperature, and micrometeorites on the small spacecraft hurtling its way 10,000 meters per second away from the Earth through the vacuum of space. Early in the morning, the mission is underway. Its launch window occurs at the point in time where the lunar plane closely matches that of the launch facility. Flight believes this point in time is now, and the mission lifts off from the pad.
25 seconds into the flight, the second stage is separated from the first, left to coast for another three minutes before firing its engine, placing Pathfinder 1 into orbit of the Earth. Once in orbit, ground control is to direct the onboard systems when to fire for the moon. With lack of automation, this requires connection to a team on the ground to fire the engine. This is the job of a spacecraft tracking and data acquisition network team in Madagascar. Unfortunately, since this has never been done before, acquiring a planned trajectory proves to be quite difficult. Nevertheless, a time to fire is chosen, and Pathfinder 1 is sent on its way to the moon. Ground teams direct the spacecraft to fire small HTP thrusters to finalize the trajectory, and feeling confident the small probe will find its way at least close to the moon, it is left to drift through space. On its way, onboard radiation sensors detect and prove the existence of a second Van Allen belt, as well as the possible edge of Earth's magnetosphere, though no instruments designed specifically to study the latter of the two are present. In about one week's time, the probe loses connection with Earth STDN sites as it drifts out of range for its transmission capabilities. Telemetry data transmitted up to that point show a good trajectory for the moon. It will be several days before connection is once again restored, as Pathfinder 1 will begin to fall victim to Earth's gravity well once again. Ground teams sleep at their station rather than going home to rest, anxiously awaiting this point in the mission. Nobody will know if the trajectory is still go until the probe reconnects. 12 days and 5 hours into the mission, STDN sites report transmission with Pathfinder 1 is back online, and telemetry data suggests its trajectory is heading straight for the moon. The reaction to this news is one of relief and pure elation. The data begins to stream in again, radiation measurements, micrometeorite strike data, temperature readings, telemetry fluctuations, pressure data, all being transmitted to Earth, being recovered by eager scientists, itching to further our understanding of the cosmos. As the twelfth day of Pathfinder 1's mission comes to a close, transmission is once again lost, blocked by the surface of the moon, and the space probe is assumed to have been destroyed moments later. That is going to wrap up this episode of For All Kerbal Kind. Thanks so much for sticking around for this one. I know I haven't had an hour long video in, well, ever, but we also did just hit 5K subscribers. So consider this sort of a celebration for that. Yeah, we're ending off today's episode with a lunar impact and we are going to, well, deal with all of the science and money that we get from that next episode, where the era of satellites is truly getting started. If you want to see what the Soviet Union has been up to, there's a link to Beardy's video in the end screen as well as the description below. There's a Discord down below where all sorts of stuff is always going on. And I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and peace out. Thank you.